this episode of 2000 books linda rotenberg co-founder of endeavor.org the world's leading organization supporting high impact entrepreneurs talks about how to build a high impact business from nothing linda rotenberg co-founded endeavor the world's leading organization supporting high impact entrepreneurs in 1997 endeavor supported companies are generating upwards of 8 billion dollars annually yes that's a billion with a b Named one of America's best leaders by U.S. News and one of Time's 100 Innovators for the 21st Century, Linda is considered among the world's most dynamic experts on entrepreneurship, innovation, and leadership. Linda is the author of New York Times bestseller, Crazy is a Compliment, The Power of Zigging When Everyone Else Sags, which is the subject of our conversation today. Linda, I'm so excited to have you here today. Welcome to 2000 Books. Thank you. Great to be here. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Tell our audience, tell our listeners, your story of founding Entre- Endeavor and what has led you to where you are today. And it's sure. probably a long story. Please go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what founding story isn't long, right? <laughs> well, so I grew up outside of Boston, uh, Massachusetts, in a traditional family. My Both parents were the first in their families to go to college. Um, but my dad then went to law school, became a lawyer. My mom um, had top of them, was a stay-at-home mom. And I assume they thought I was going to you know, go to college and graduate school and take a traditional path. Well, they got two out of the three right. I went to Harvard, and then I went to Yale Law School, and I was on their track, and then I suddenly got off of it and had no interest in practicing law. And I went off, some professors took pity on me and sent me to Latin America, and I fell in love. I was living in Argentina, and she I fell in love with the countries, not a person. Um, and I noticed at the time, I went to work for an organization that was supporting social entrepreneurs, but I kept wondering where the business entrepreneurs, you know, where it was now the mid nineties, Netscape and Yahoo and the entrepreneurial spirit and Steve Jobs was now back at Apple and no one was talking about this in Latin America. And when I would dig, they would say, well, this is not relevant to my life. You know, I don't even have a garage. So these stories of the Silicon Valley garage don't apply to me. I don't have role models and no one's going to give me money to launch my crazy idea. Right. And It really hit home when I was in a taxi in Argentina and the driver had an engineering degree so that you of all people should be an entrepreneur. And I couldn't think of the word entrepreneur in Spanish and neither could he because it didn't exist. And so back then you had this word for big business leader, empresario, but you didn't have a word even to describe entrepreneurial activity um, in Spanish or Portuguese, let alone Arabic or Turkish or Indonesian. And so I went home and said, this is ridiculous. There have to be you know, support for high growth entrepreneurs. And everyone thought I was nuts. I had a co-founder named Peter, but everyone thought we were crazy. I went back to raise money in Latin America and was literally called Chica Loca, the crazy girl, which I took as a badge of honor. That is why crazy as a compliment became my motto, which we'll talk about. Um, but just to finish this story, one of my favorite moments came five years later when Endeavor was already operating at that point in four countries, and the editor of the Portuguese, not Spanish, but Portuguese English Dictionary in Brazil called up our team and saying they were adding the words emprendedor and emprendedorismo, entrepreneur and entrepreneurship. It's the same in Spanish, different spelling than Portuguese, but same thing because of Endeavor's work. So now, every time I go to Latin America and tell my founding story, they're like, you gringa, don't you know there's this word emprendedor? <laughs> so that is, that's the story. Wow, that is, that is quite fascinating. And of course, uh, the early stages of building this or starting Endeavor were not, not easy, not, uh, they were definitely painful. And as you said, you know, some people called you crazy. Some people called you uh, that you're, uh, who are you to think that big? And that's part of every entrepreneur's journey in some ways, right? That's part of what all of us have to go through. And uh, one of the things that you write in the book is that the most valuable backer we need is ourselves. You know, we think we need the outside world to help us, which is important. But believing in ourselves is it's the starting point. It's the genesis. Absolutely. And, um, you know, when I was called crazy, Chica Loca, I mean, it was, it was not meant, it was meant as an insult, I think, (laughs) but 
I decided I'm going to own it, right? And so I started believing that there's a corollary to this uh, phrase, which is that if you're not being called crazy when you're starting something new, then you're probably not thinking big enough. But what that means by definition is if you're going to start something, whether it's a project inside an existing business or organization, or you're going to consider leaving a full-time job to, you know, to start something on your own, or you're going to be like me, where you're not going to go into the traditional path that your parents expected, that is scary because people are going to say you're out of your minds, or you may bankrupt your family, or what are you doing? And so what I've what, what I said, what you alluded to is if you're expecting outside validation at the beginning, you're probably looking in the wrong place because it's not going to come because most people um, are afraid of change and they are going to uh, be fixated on the status quo. And if entrepreneurship is about disrupting the status quo, that's threatening. So in fact, you have to look internally. And that my, my belief is that most people psych themselves out before they psych themselves up. Mm -hmm. And so many people, because they're afraid of other people's reactions, don't give themselves the permission to take that step forward. So yes, I believe that the biggest thing you have to do is you have to convince yourself that you're going to try and it may not work, but you're going to take the step and even if that means people are going to call you crazy. And this is a very difficult thing. What you're ta talking about here, it's not an easy thing because the force of society, the force of everyone mm -hmm. in some ways is against you. Like people are questioning totally. what you're doing. People are questioning your idea, your judgment, your uh, everything that you stand for. People That's are questioning that. So in your, in your experience, now you've been at it for 20 years, you've seen all kinds of entrepreneurship what makes certain people able to withstand that and still be yes. able to stand for what they want while others don't like what is it or what's, yeah, I, what no, i think there are two i have two different answers i think one is at the beginning this idea that you're going to give yourselves that permission because the and you're not going to listen to to other people, especially not family and friends. Friends and family are either going to be, they're, they're not reliable narrators. They're either going to tell you this is the worst idea they've ever heard of and freak you out, or they're going to be like the bride trying on the last fitting of her bride's dress where all they're going to do is flatter you and compliment you. Either way, it's just it's just not reliable. So I think that getting away from your the people closest to you and going out into the community, whether it's online, whether it's on Facebook or Kickstarter or the you know farmer's market or your cubicle, it's just, I think that um, the market will tell you soon enough whether your idea is good or not, but that's not the problem for most people. It's that internal belief you said to either to even withstand the criticism. And to, so that first thing I think makes people stand out is that willingness to take a chance, that willingness to allow themselves to think differently and to give themselves permission to be called crazy, right? I think the second thing um, happens uh, in terms of how you choose what you are going to do as an entrepreneur. And this is my belief working in 30 markets outside the United States is that when you are someone who is solving a real pain point, particularly one that you yourself faced, you are motivated every single day to wake up and solve this problem. When you are trying to reverse engineer what you think Silicon Valley thinks is going to be the next unicorn and you hit the same stumbling block that every entrepreneur faces, it's going to be a lot tougher because you think, oh, maybe that banking job doesn't look so bad. Mm -hmm. So I really believe, I always focus on the entrepreneur plus the idea and why is this particular entrepreneur doing this particular idea? Because I think that if you can genuinely explain why you're passionate about solving a certain problem or doing this particular thing in a way that's that's better pe for people, more efficient for people, going to reach a different group, and it's authentic, I think that will help you get over the hard parts, because there are parts of the entrepreneur journey. Yeah, yeah. Okay, this is great. So I think passion, as you say, is a, a very important component of being able to drive ourselves to the to, 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 to go past the criticism of everything that the world is or everything that the world stands for in, at but, some point. And it's, it's not just passion. Just passion can be blind, right? It's mm -hmm. uh, Cupid's blind. <laughs> it's, it's an authentic sense of why 
no one has solved a problem that you've identified that's a real pain point and why you can help improve your life and the lives of other people like you. And, and, and it's that authentic belief that your idea needs to be out there in the world. That is different than I think than just passion per se. Okay, so is, is this an intersection of what you enjoy and also what the world needs? Is that what we're saying here? In some ways, uh, it's not just your passion, but also what the world needs and where there's actually a business demand. Yeah, I yes, I think that that's well said. Okay. And part of it is what you enjoy or part of it is what pisses you off so much because it's working so poorly that you have to fix it. I don't know, maybe this is my, uh, you know, my experience working outside of, 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 markets like uh, California and New York. I work inside the United States. We work in Detroit or Miami or in Louisville or Atlanta. In, we're working in emerging markets. There's a lot of things that don't work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so a lot of people's passions is around fixing things that they know should be more, more effective than they are rather than coming up with the next cool app. Right. Yeah. If you if you if you have an idea for a cool app, fine. Maybe that will keep you motivated for a while. I just personally have seen people get bored then. Whereas if you think that, you know, you're, for example, I, we have a company called Doctor Consulta in Brazil that is changing the way you know uh, medical uh, services are delivered and cutting deaths down, right down because they're finding out the, you know the ways to automate you know um, different hospital records. That that's going to keep you motivated. Yeah, yeah. So because I mean the journey is going to be tough, it's going to be hard and you need yeah. something that's going to keep you excited even when the challenges are mounting and that's that's super important. Exactly. And that's where, and that's, exactly. That's where your personal joy comes into the play, comes into play as well. Um uh, or personal yes. passion comes into play. Um so one of the things you talk about and uh, that was a very interesting way of putting it is, you know, when we're in the early stages, there are challenges, there are uh, setbacks, but one of the ways you get through them is what you call stalking, stalking people of all kinds, of all sorts, because, you know, as we build our businesses, one of the fundamentals is that we have to work with other people. We have to enroll right. other people in the movement and yes. <laughs> stalking or whichever way you like it, I guess stalking is a good word there because sometimes it's very hard to enroll people in the movement. Yes. Now, it's gentle stalking, kind stalking. <laughs> but I do, yes, my phrase is that stalking is an underrated startup strategy. And when I was launching Endeavor, I used to, you know, go up to people. I'd see people on planes that looked like they were, you know, reading something entrepreneurial that was, that was uh, had to do with what I was trying to do. Or in the gym, they'd be on the, you know, the treadmill. And so I used to say I, I took people in confined spaces and was very nice about it, <laughs> but would engage them in dialogue when they really had no escape. Um, but I think that the the real reason, and there, by the way, uh, people like Estee Lauder, a mm -hmm. famous stalker, you know, some of the best entrepreneurs stalked. And I think the the reason this is important, um, I don't want people to literally actually stalk people, but is that you don't have to have a built-in network. You don't have to have um, the the financing all set up. You don't have to come from a family or a school that has instant alumni connections. That that if you have a good idea and you genuinely believe someone is is interested in you and most of us with linkedin you know, reed hoffman's a good friend of mine is on my board with linkedin we're usually one or two steps away you know let alone the six degrees of separation from people and and if if you give someone an authentic message again about why they specifically should be interested many people not all but many people will actually respond so i think that um we have to get over our fear of you know going up to people i remember i was mentor doing a mentor session for tori Birch and she was inviting um, in New York about 50 hand-picked entrepreneurs early stage to for to a speed dating mentoring session okay so I'm in the mentoring session these people were in all businesses but there was one fashion designer that I was meeting and she said well my icon my role model is Tori Birch and I said well she's standing over there you know why don't you go talk to her she said oh no I, I couldn't do that and I said, she invited you to a session at her place of business. Go up and talk to her. And she she was so nervous. And by the end, I saw this woman handing Tori her business card. So what you know, score one for stalking. But it means, I mean, so many of us are so intimidated or think that if we don't have built-in networks or built-in sources of financing, that we have no way to get our 
our businesses started. So this is a way to say, even if you're an outsider, if you have a belief in an idea and find people you think would be interested, go go for it. Yeah, no, stalking is uh is important. I probably stalked you on email a few times before you agreed to <laughs> See? do this. See, it worked. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> you had a funny story where you actually signed up one of the co-chairs for Endeavor by telling him, "Tell us the story." It's 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 yeah. it's so. When I was reading it, it was so memorable and so funny. I was like, "Man, this is a very underrated strategy." <laughs> <laughs> so I uh, yeah so. We were, so my co-founder and I were setting up Endeavor to support entrepreneurs in emerging markets. And we actually got people, uh, top business leaders in Brazil and in Chile and, and um, uh, Argentina and in Mexico. Now we're in, you know, the Middle East and Southeast Asia and Africa and Europe. But anyway, this we're starting in Latin America. And we've done very well locally, but there, were, there weren't very many people in the United States that wanted to sign on to this organization to support entrepreneurs outside the United States. They didn't even believe there were any. And I decided we needed an advisory board here of people that had gravitas, right? So I was, um, one of my my mentors um, was uh, Bill Solomon, who is a professor of Harvard Business, uh, of entrepreneurial finance at Harvard Business School, who was mildly interested in what we were doing, but a little bit skeptical. <laughs> but we've been talking to him. But meanwhile, there had been someone I had my eye on named Peter Brook. He was the founding father of international venture capital. He founded Advent International. He had founded TA Associates. He really, he's now um, in his late 70s, but he was you know, really one of the founders of venture capital um, as an industry. And he was speaking at Harvard Business School. And I knew all these aggressive HBS students at the time were going to go run up to him after the podium. So I saw him going to the men's room and I waited outside. <laughs> and after he came out of the men's room, I, I handed him my card and I said, look, you know, I'm, my name is Linda Rotenberg and I'm starting this organization to support entrepreneurs around the world and emerging markets. I know you, you do international venture capital. I'd really like to come talk to you. And he was so startled because I literally hit him right outside the men's room. <laughs> but he said, well, who's supporting you? And I thought about it for two seconds and said, well, Bill Salmon, you know, is supporting us. And he's actually, you know, he's going to, we're starting an advisory board and he's going to join. And we'd like you to be the other, you know, co-chair. And Peter Brooks says, wait, Salmon's doing this? Oh, that's interesting. So he leaves. I march up to Bill's office uh, in, 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 at HBS and said, Bill, Peter Brook just agreed to be the founding co-chair of our Global Advisory Board as long as you do it. Are you in? And, he, and Bill Salma says, wait a minute, Brooke is doing this? Oh, that's interesting. I'm in. And two years later, after they had, you know, <laughs> run all these committee meetings, they finally discovered that neither one of them had actually ever officially signed up. <laughs> <laughs> That, that is that that to me is straight up pure hustle in the sense you know <laughs> although i told the story and someone who's been involved in my organization said oh my god you lied you're a liar i said no come on <laughs> i they could have said no i just said they were had agreed to do it the other one didn't have to sign on <laughs> yeah uh, yeah maybe maybe they maybe uh, yeah, lying is lying is beyond it, but uh, hustle is probably the hustle. Like, hustle exactly. Is, it's it's um, it's. <laughs> but now Bill ended up writing a case studies on us at, at Harvard Business School, and he every time I would show up, he'd call me the stocky, the st <laughs> uh, he'd call himself the stocky, he'd call me the stalker. Oh, okay. Sorry. So, so you're the crazy lady, you're the stalker. Well, there's no, quite a few no, things going on. Nice, so. right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. So so. This is okay. So we've got to get people involved, and sometimes you know, we, <laughs> stalking is the right strategy. But another really powerful strategy that you talk about is having mentors, having mentors from yeah. all different angles. Because a lot of times, traditional mentorship says, okay, one mentor, or right. you know, one mentor who will guide you along the journey. But you have a very different view of it, and I guess Endeavor has a very different view of it. Endeavor is formed on that yeah. idea, right? Yeah, I, I, Tom Friedman called us the world's mentor capitalists. So we believe in mentorship in, in a big way. And in my own world, I, I mean, I, I came up when people still thought 
that you got one, maybe two, three jobs in your entire lifetime, right? Now, now we no longer, we know that that's not going to be the case. But so there was this idea that you found, as you said, one mentor with gray hair to guide you along the journey. And I found this incredibly stressful. You know, here I was, I was in my 20s and I thought, oh my God, I have to find a husband and a mentor? Like, this is just too much stress. <laughs> and so I, 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 my, my, my line is that you, you need to be monogamous in your private life, but you should be poly mentorish <laughs> and that the idea of one mentor is just a crock because you know you really need a circle of mentors and you need people who are older than you younger than you people who are in your business people who are, have nothing to do with your business but care about you and can guide you in other ways and I actually think that frenemies you know often make the best mentors because people I mean I often meet with people who are could be competitors right but we 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 go through more similar things than almost anybody else so sometimes your frenemies actually understand the challenges you're going through better than anybody else but I think that one of the things that happens and when we um, set up mentors for Endeavor Entrepreneurs, we set up three or four person advisory boards. I think having one mentor puts too much stress on the relationship. And I think actually creating a group where each person individually knows the one thing maybe they're responsible for that you're relying on them takes the pressure off, right? And then you can say, okay, I'm going to come to you once a month. We're going to have, you know, coffee for half an hour. I'm going to have a 15 minute call, but it's on this particular issue. I'm calling you by HR or I'm calling you about finance rather than one mentor who feels like, oh my God, your entire career is in my hands. So I think that that that, that to me, um, in some ways, rather than being more stressful, kind of shares the burden and, and is more effective in the in the um, outrun. So get a, get a circle of mentors. Absolutely, this is so critical. This is so huge. I think the biggest hack that we have as mentors is people. I mean, as not as mentors, but as entrepreneurs, as people, is being yeah. able to access the knowledge that's in there, not knowledge, but the wisdom that exists in their heads, and to be able to tap into it for our purposes and. Not be limited to one person, but right. a board. Or what we do and what I do is what we call a mastermind group, where we have a group of people, who, peers, who are all yes. starting their own businesses, and we all sit in together. And even though we are in similar businesses in the information business, we are yeah. very far apart in the kinds of businesses we do, and we're able to mentor each other in the process. Right. Yeah. And, and and I think that sometimes works, but sometimes words, look, I'm just dealing with this and 20 years in my board, you know, it's just too much to talk about one topic with all these people because they don't get enough airtime, then they're frustrated, then you're frustrated. In fact, one of the other things about having this circle of mentors is you can go one on one on a more specific deep dive topic, right? So, you know, in my case, Reed Hoffman says, I want to, ca I care about our co investment fund. That's what I want to talk to you about. Someone else says, I only care about HR. That's what I'm talking about. Somebody else says, I don't care. I, I only care about financial sustainability. And that is almost, that's so much better than trying to get one topic that a group of people sort of talk to as a formal board that that I find so I actually think that can help not only to alleviate the pressure of one mentor but sometimes when you're an entrepreneur starting out you don't need or want a formal board of directors but to have a group of advisors and mentors that you can call upon is is really critical okay so so I think for someone who's listening, they're probably wondering, they're, they're thinking, okay, easy for Linda to say, easy for Manny to say, they've been doing this for a while. And how do, how do I go about finding my mentors? How do I go about finding my advisory board or whatever it is? Uh, because I don't know these people. I can't uh, reach out to someone who's way above me. I, how do I go about doing this? So, so what's the process there? What, what, do you, what do people have to do to get their mentors? Well, I think it is also, you know, a bit weird if someone comes up to you and says, can you be my mentor? <laughs> like that, that's, you know, that, that is the wrong kind of stalking, I would say. <laughs> that's just kind of creepy. So I think that, I think that's people like have to realize. For, asking for getting married before you start dating, so. Yeah, exactly. And, and um, so I think that, you know, many people who are entrepreneurs are hustlers and whether they're part of online groups or whether they go to conferences, you know, we, or, or as human beings, or we go out and then now in almost every city in the world, there are, you know, is in gatherings, right, of entrepreneurs that you can go to. And so I think starting out by saying, first of all, it doesn't have to be some gray-haired expert with a certain resume. Starting out, one, and, and in any situation we're in, if we connect with someone, you know, it's simple as go out for coffee or start a day. And then, and then once you realize that, what they're helpful with. I think that if you can say, look, this specific area was super helpful. Do you mind if I follow up? 
mm-hmm. because it's too stressful. If you say, can you be my mentor? Mm-hmm. Can I have a t- four hours of your time? No way. But if you, someone said, you know what, what you said in that conference or what, what we talked about um, after that session that we went to we, uh, on this specific topic was so helpful. I'd love to pick your brain for 15 minutes on this specific topic. Many people would say, okay. And then if that goes well, then you say, God, this was so helpful. Um, can can I call you in a month and, and give you feedback on how that worked out? Okay. Do you know how many people we assign as mentors who say people never call them back? They never say they never thank them. They never take their advice. They never say what what happened. Did they take their advice? Did they not? So I think if you can follow up with people, it's kind of writing like writing a thank you note, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but the more specific, the more concrete, the more focused, the more short. Li- you know, uh, lived the interactions need to be the less pressure you're putting on the other person, and then organically it can grow into something more. That's what I found. Yeah, this is great. This is great advice because it's really easy to go very specific on the question you need to ask yeah. and ask that question, and then follow through. What that does, I mean, people think that a lot of times when you're starting, you believe that you don't have anything to offer to that person. But the thing you're offering to that person in the moment is a sort of uh, fulfillment they get when they see that someone has walked the path that they're suggested. And they are happy to keep on guiding you along the journey because you are doing what you said you would do or you're doing what they said you should do. Exactly. That that makes them feel uh, gratified. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And I think that no one wants, look, people value their own time. And I think that, so if you have a short interaction, but then you can show how that advice actually changed what you did. So in Endeavor, for example, is we have entrepreneurs from all over the world, they're screened locally, and then they have to come through an international selection panel. So we're getting international experts. They're flying to, you know, we have, we, we uh, just had one in Kuala Lumpur. We're having one in California in Silicon Valley. We're having one in Beirut. We're having one, you know, all over the world, London. And so they're coming, giving their time, and they're meeting for about, uh, an hour with with each of the candidates and then decide who's going to be an endeavor entrepreneur but in any event in that so they're meeting with the, these candidates for an hour many of them if they don't follow up then they're not you know going to get anywhere but the number of people say to me that after that one interaction they get a specific note from an entrepreneur talking about the two pieces of advice they got from that person and how they followed up and how it changed the course of their company well, that makes them these mentors feel good, and then they want to do it again, right? So I think that it's little things. It sounds so silly, but the number of people who don't write the thank you note or don't follow up, then no one wants to interact with them again. So it's it's the little things that show you're valuing that other person's time that actually makes a huge difference. Yeah, yeah. The little things really do matter, and that's, that's the game of entrepreneurship in some ways. It's not yeah. about one grand idea and then you go about making it happen it's small ideas one by one executing on them changing them modifying them and going after it from that perspective and i think that's a perspective we can take in all walks of our life uh, including including finding mentors or even finding health or relationships or whatever it is like small little steps are way better than Yes, I have. I, I use it in, in crazy as a compliment in the book. Um, I have a, a chapter of, of kind of white of mistakes that people make and how you get over them in the in the scale up phase of, of starting out. And one one of the lessons um, is eat the elephant one bite at a time. And it's actually from air, the Air Force. And the Air Force would train people and would put people in these really horrific situations. And the ones that saw the overwhelming the elephant to the room and ha- and tried to you know get out of a situation all at once, they all failed. And the ones that broke it down piece by piece, solving you know a little challenge at a time, those are the ones who ultimately succeed, right? So you've got, that is entrepreneurship to a T, right? Yeah. It is one big, huge elephant. <laughs> and I think that if we can start to break it down and eat the elephant one bite at a time and just solve one focused little problem, then day by day, bit by bit, we get closer to our goals. But without you know, and, and the setbacks are small rather than some enormous setback that causes the whole idea to come crashing down. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, if there's one thing we can take away, all of us can take away from this interview, it's the it's that it's always small. One step at a time is all we need yes. to make it really, you know, make that idea come alive. Um, yeah, this is great, Linda. And we've been talking so much of Endeavor. I mean, we've been talking about bits and pieces of Endeavor, but there are so many of our, uh, like, I'm sure a lot of our aren't, audience is wondering what Endeavor is all about. Like, what's the process? What, what, what does Endeavor do 
for entrepreneurs. So please tell us a little more about Endeavor, how it goes, like what's the process for an yeah. early stage entrepreneur and how do they go about uh, Sure. I'll talk about, so, um, so I co-founded Endeavor 20 years ago. Now we're in 28 countries plus four U.S. cities. I mentioned um, Atlanta, Louisville, Detroit, and Miami. Going to other U.S. cities, going to other countries, but uh, we're all over the world. And we ha- we set up local teams who go scouring for high growth companies um, that are at that inflection point where they've started something, but they they're going to be scaling. What? What is the what is high growth to you guys? What's the metric there? Well, we're not looking for um, f- for uh, lifestyle businesses. We're looking for people who really want to grow, whether it's through employment or through you know. Um, so it's 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 either about uh, the number of franchises or if they're a tech company. It's about year on year growth. It's for people who are aiming big. Right? Is there and, is there a certain dollar dollar revenue number that you look at where you say, okay, this is where we get into this business? No, we have people that are pre-revenue to people who are fifty million dollars in revenues, but think they should be five billion. So it really, it really runs the gamut. But they have to have had traction, and they have to show that there is a real path forward and a passion to get to that next step. Um, but anyway, once people become an endeavor entrepreneur, the process takes about six to twelve months. Then we build these advisory boards for them around the world. We have access to uh, networks locally and globally. We have now a co-investment fund that will invest in their next rounds. And we have a group of uh, investors that that look at who the Endeavor entrepreneurs are to to actually lead the rounds. Um, and then the entrepreneurs of by and for entrepreneurs. So our entrepreneurs now joining, they are become the mentors, they become the investors, they become the, the board members. But, but I should say that, you know, Endeavor really is looking for the gazelles, right? We're looking for um, the, the highest growth companies. Companies. And the reason I wrote Crazy as a Compliment, the book, which is how I think you found out and stalked me, Manny, is that I said, look, not everyone is destined to be, um, they're not aiming to be the next Uber, the next Facebook, the next Starbucks, you know, um, they are looking to create something new inside a bigger company, right? Mm-hmm. They want to start a project. They want to start a uh, not a mom and pop, but something that's more of a lifestyle business. They want to employ maybe five to 10 to 20 people, but they don't aim to uh, employ hundreds of people. Uh, people who have a family business, but want to take it to the next you know, level, um, or people who want to start a social enterprise. So um, the reason, so it, within Crazy as a Compliment, I started dividing these people into different members of the animal kingdom. Uh, I hate social entrepreneur and mompreneur and uh, intrapreneur. So I, I started calling people, you know, butterflies if they're the mom and pops because they aim for freedom or they want to be sort of the, the yoga instructor who actually has their own their own business. Or um, uh, the, the tech entrepreneurs and the high growth ones are the gazelles, obviously. And then um, my favorite of the labels are the skunks. Uh, They're the entrepreneurs partly because um, Lockheed Martin had the famous skunk works program where you actually had a group of people inside a company that were trying to make change. But I also sort of say that if you're a skunk, your job is to stink up the joint, Mm -hmm. right? And tell your boss what they're doing wrong. And in fact, so many people have come up to me waving my book and saying, I'm a skunk, I'm a skunk. Uh, Anyway, and and then I have dolphins for the social entrepreneurs. But the point is that I wrote the book for people to say, no matter where you are, no matter what your business or your enterprise is, your idea is, that today everyone needs to think and act like an entrepreneur and that we all need this mindset and this skill set in a world that is constantly changing. Because I think that what I've learned from working in emerging markets is that we in the United States overemphasize stability Um, And stability favors the status quo. If you're an entrepreneur, you root for chaos. (laughs) And that chaos is the friend of the entrepreneur. So in these markets that never have stability, they're actually very good at managing chaos. And I think here we become, and this is where, again, our families and friends sort of get nervous when we say we're going to do something disruptive or maybe leave our jobs or uh, take out a loan. And I think that um, that's what we have to realize is that anything we're doing takes a little bit of risk, but that the greatest risk of all is to take no risk Mm -hmm. because the world's changing anyway. And that also entrepreneurs, even though they take that initial risk, 
really what they the best entrepreneurs end up looking at how do I minimize risk, not maximize risk? How do I get all the data points so that in fact what I'm doing is less scary, it is less risky, um, but it's just about doing something different and then gathering the data points to make sure that if I have a failure, it's going to be a limited one. Mm-hmm. Okay, so so I mean, of course, the book caters to a much wider audience compared to what Endeavor is targeted towards. And uh, just to clarify, do you think of Endeavor as an accelerator, as a uh, incubator, or uh, you know, or do you guys take uh, do you guys take any um, any kind of uh, equity play in the businesses? Yeah. So Endeavor itself started because there was no trust in these markets. And we said we have to have the trust and the social capital. Endeavor started as uh, fully as a, as, a, as a nonprofit, as sort of a network, right, of mentors. So Endeavor Global and all our affiliates are as no, are nonprofits, but then we have these funds that are returning, you know, LP capital, uh, <coughs> the returns of which go to scale Endeavor, right? So LPs will make their money back in 50% of the upside and 50% of the upside will go to scale Endeavor so that when our companies is one, a couple have gone public <coughs> or been, been acquired for, for significant amounts, the idea is that over time Endeavor will be fully self-sustaining. So we are, we are a hybrid. So we have the for-profit LP funds. We have the nonprofit um, that is the mentor capital. And this is confusing to a lot of people, particularly older people that don't understand are you nonprofit or are you for profit? Mm-hmm. And so what I've gone around saying is that just as young people, millennials, no longer see you know uh, gender as male female, it's gender beyond the binary. We why do we have to be uh, profit binary? So we are officially trans profit. <laughs> we, we are a trans profit. No, but I but but I think that ultimately the goal is our entrepreneurs um, know that once they succeed, they're going to give back. They become the mentors. They become the investors, both in Endeavor itself and in the entrepreneurs, other entrepreneurs. They become the board members. So it's really I've always seen it as of by and for entrepreneurs. That's been the driving point. Um, but our goal is to build these ecosystems. Hmm. All right. Well, this has been great, Linda. This has been a lot of fun, a lot of great learning for all our listeners, for me as well. So tell our listeners where to find you, where to you know stalk you if they can, and all the good stuff. Uh, well, I'm on you know, Twitter, Linda Rotenberg. You can go to Endeavor.org. Um, Endeavor spelled without, if you're in British, in, in Great Britain, it's not the British way, no you. So it's E-N-D-E-A-V-O-R, no you. Uh, Crazy is a compliment is the book. Um, and, uh, you know, I wish all of you luck. I think being an entrepreneur is uh, is imperative these days. I think it's uh, the best way to view the world, right? It's boring to go view the world the way everybody else does. So I love that entrepreneurs see the world differently. And what I would say is you've already, if you identify as an entrepreneur, you've already, back to our first question, right? You've already done the hard part, right? You've already given yourself that permission. So every other step along the way, while it will continue to be hard, uh, know that the hardest part of all is taking that first step. So congratulations. You've gotten to day one (laughs) and uh, wish you all the luck on your journeys. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Linda, for taking the time to do this.